I'm Ann Bocock and welcome to Between the Covers presented by WXEL Television and Murder on the Beach Mystery Bookstore in Delray Beach. My guest is award-winning author James O'Born. And in addition to his writing fiction, he's also a former U.S. Drug Enforcement agent and he's currently a special agent with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And it's my pleasure to have James Bourne as my guest today. Thank, Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. The new book, as we, we see, is Border War, and you are the co-author. I am. With Lou Dobbs, yes. who we know as the legendary broadcaster. Talk about a timely book. I, I have to ask, when you started this collaboration, did you have any idea that we'd be talking about the border every single newscast? Well, and it wasn't just the border. The border is always an issue. And of course, Lou is known for his, keeping an eye on the border and talking about it. And I had some experience with it, so we kind of, we mixed it all together. It was a couple of years putting the book together. But there were a lot of things in there that during the course of, as the book was about to come out, this is one of the only books I know that, that had a, an aspect of the National Security Agency in it, and a character who works for the NSA. And of course, all the NSA information breaks not long before the book comes out. And there were a couple other things uh, about privacy and things like that that were in the book that obviously we had no idea that, that any of that was going to happen. I claim credit that we do, but we didn't. Foresight. You, you write fiction. You write crime thrillers. The books you've written before have been crime thrillers, very witty dialogue. And Lou Dobbs writes nonfiction books. He, um, how did this collaboration come about? And is it he, tricky? It's a little tricky. Uh, he, and we didn't know each other. Now we're friends. I can say, and you know, we can talk back and forth. First time we ever talked, you know, I met face to face. I said, you know, we're not going to agree on everything. And he has the right answer that no one can argue with. That's why we live in America. You're right. Okay. After that, everything was smooth sailing. We would have disagreements about uh, he was interested in, in, in focusing on an issue from a, a novel, a fiction point of view, so that you know you might understand things better. Uh, I listen. Uh, there's a fellow named Ralph Peters, who's a novelist, used to write uh, military thrillers, and now he writes Civil War historical novels. And I heard him one day say, a, a historical novel, uh, a nonfiction tells you what happened. A historical novel tells you what it was like while it was happening. And that's sort of what this is. Instead of telling you, you know, the border's not secure, let's show what happens when the border's not secure, when people can go back and forth. Now, our book doesn't focus on kids coming across the border, but it does focus on what would happen if a criminal organization on the Mexican side of the border decides, okay, we're going to start doing things on the, on the Texas side of the border. So you both felt that doing this book as fiction gave you more leeway, made the story more palpable? Yeah, and I only write fiction. I'm not interested in, because we talked about doing a nonfiction book. It doesn't interest me. Uh, the idea of, uh, I like working on novels because I can think about them when I'm riding my bike in the morning or you know, when I'm doing something. The joke is when my wife's talking to me, I can be thinking about the novel. <laughs> uh, but uh, I like thinking about it all day and then working on it in the evening. Uh, whereas nonfiction, you, there's a lot of research. There's a lot of people that, no matter what you say, uh, they will attack that when it's when it's nonfiction. And I have one of my early mentors was uh, Joseph Wambaugh. A lot of you know one of the first cops turned writers, and he wrote an article. I'll never forget. Right when my first book came out about ten years ago, I happened to read this article, and the title was "Lawyers Are the New Terrorists," <laughs> and he said that uh, in all of his Nonfiction books, every nonfiction book, and I don't remember how many it was, he had been sued and he successfully defended himself. But it still cost him a little over $2 million to defend himself oh, wow. successfully. That's crazy. So uh, I remember as soon as I read that, I, I'm sticking to, because I thought there's a couple of things I'm interested in. And I can, um, the one area I'm interested in, some of you, 
you're probably not as long time a resident as I am. I was born in West Palm Beach, although I've lived all over. But uh, the Chillensworth murder, which was a judge who was murdered in what is now uh, Manalapan, uh, the only sitting judge in Palm Beach County at the time, city circuit court judge. Uh, I was always interested in that, and I did a lot of research, and I wrote several articles. And I thought about expanding that. And someone wrote me on one of these articles that I wrote because I'd gotten something that I got from the Palm Beach Post in 1955, I got from their archives. And the gentleman said to me, I successfully sued the Palm Beach Post in 1955, and I will successfully sue you now. <laughs> and I said, like, yeah. But then I was doing the math, and I thought, well, this is, two, it was about 2005. I was like, I think I can wait this guy out. <laughs> Being in law enforcement and writing fiction, or do you write with a very critical eye that you will get the details right? That's the one thing that I can bring to most books. And all my friends who are writers will always say, okay, you know, what kind of gun would they use? And I say, you're missing the big picture. What's the story? What is the human impact? And the thing that drives me crazy is that they'll, most, many writers will view the murder of someone other than, you know, someone who's obviously a victim. The, say, say the police shoot and kill a drug dealer. They just kind of write that off like, oh, no one cares. And I try to explain to them, that drug dealer has a mother who's very upset right now, has kids who don't have a father. There's an impact. It's his fault. Don't get me wrong. I'm not blaming other people. That's the life he chose. But it does have impact. So when I see these books like, you know, uh, A Hobby of Murder and the lady is, you know, knits and solves crimes on the side. Well, her crimes, those books that I've read don't seem to have the emotion to it when someone's dead. Oh, you know, we found Uncle Joe with a knitting needle through his neck. Okay, you think about how you walk into your house and you find your uncle with a knitting needle in his neck. How are you going to react? And that's how I look at books. I want it to be accurate, but I don't want to get lost in the details. So when a, an investigation unfolds in one of my books, it's what would really happen. And it's not what you think. It's not, CSI is not an accurate depiction of how things happened. You have to have someone that looks at a case that is, that is committed to the case. There's so many elements to it. Uh, and how, that's where it makes it easier for me writing a crime novel because I know how it would unfold. I don't have to do the research. And it, you know, if you find DNA here, what do you do? What do you, you know? I understand how all that works. And I try to put it in my novels in an entertaining way. Uh, I, a lot of the dialogue is from, there's no one funnier in the world, I'm sorry, no one funnier than veteran cops, because they will say anything and they don't care whether you agree with it or disagree with it or is politically correct. I bet you in all my books I've used about three lines that I ever came up with at the right time. Uh, that's what my books are all about, is all the things I wish I would have said after someone walked away. <laughs> uh, but one of them I used uh, in one of the books, I was getting yelled at by one of my bosses in Miami. He's a great guy. Uh, I still am, in, he's been retired 15 years, and I'm still in touch with him. But he would yell, you, you knew that if you are getting yelled at, you really weren't going to get in trouble. You were just getting yelled at. And he was yelling at, I don't even remember what it was. I do, but I don't want to repeat it because it was kind of <laughs> stupid. Uh, and I, I was there with my partner, and he says, I can't believe you guys would be this effing stupid. And for some reason, I looked at him and I said, boss, that is just another example of you underestimating us. <laughs> and, uh, so I have that in the book and a couple other things, uh, some of the earlier books. Uh, this one is a little more serious. I mean, you don't, you don't joke around with Lou Dobbs. You say, hey, you know, how do we want to handle this? And I've got to say, for a guy who's a powerful guy, who was ahead of CNN for a while, and uh, he was very open to ideas. He would try things. He would, uh, uh, and he would listen to me when I'd say, okay, they you probably were, wouldn't talk about like that. You were a team. Absolutely. Is it, I'm, I'm imagining because in law enforcement that is not a solitary existence, you're right. a good team player anyway. It, yeah, you try to be, but the other thing is if you, you can both dig in, especially if you both think you're right, and uh, he would have probably won those battles, but he, he really didn't. I always told him, you know, he's, a, he's, a, he's not like these guys that went to the Harvard uh, seminars in New York and call themselves, he's an actual Harvard grad, beginning to end. And I always tell him, I don't really hold that against him because, you know, I went to Florida State. I'll try not to talk <laughs> down to you. Uh, and so I make a lot of Harvard jokes through the whole book. 
Uh, I actually made a couple of University of Florida jokes in there too. Uh, but he was, he was very easy to deal with. Uh, I have the best thing, and one of the reasons I got involved is obviously he does most of the promotion on it. He talked about it on his book, he did all. So I wasn't killing myself. And in the years past, I have, you know, you go to a book festival, you do this. I finally got to the point about three or four years ago, I said, I'm not, I'm not doing any of this stuff anymore. I'm just slowly starting to do a few more things now. Uh, so that was, you know, I, I can't overstate how important that is. The book, Border War, takes place really on the border between two sister cities, El Paso, Texas, El Paso. and Juarez, Mexico. And I, I think if I'm right, geographically about 19 miles apart, not very far at all. No, like less? Like a thousand feet. A thousand actually. feet apart, okay. When you stand in El Paso, you look across a river they call Rio Grande, which is not that grand, and, and you're looking at uh, a million I, miles apart no. in every other aspect. It, uh, and, and you know, I spent a lot of time in El Paso and Juarez, not even for this book, just over the years, back when it was a little safer. And two years ago, just before I was starting this book, uh, I met, I was on a cruise, and I met a guy who was a DEA agent, same job I used to have, in, and he's in El Paso. And we were talking back and forth, and he actually, uh, he was very complimentary of the books and things like that, and um, he was talking about the number of murders, and, and this was before it even skyrocketed. El Paso is like, how can I, I'm trying to think of the right, would be like Boca Raton, a couple of murders, <laughs> probably people that deserved it. Uh, you know, just not, not what you'd think of as a dangerous town, directly across, so looking from Boca Raton to Delray Beach. Actually, this is a pretty good example. <laughs> uh, but Juarez is bigger, a much bigger city. That's a big difference. Most of the cities on the Mexican side are smaller than the cities they're connected to on the US side. This is the opposite. It is a much bigger city. But the number of murders is staggering. At one point, it was, uh, I think, 1,900 a year. I had, it's in the book, I, uh, compared to about 12 in El Paso. Not 1,200, 12 murders. So uh, that's part of the premise of the book. What happens when this, cry, this violence creeps across the border? How do people react? What, what are the elements that come together to try and stop it? And it doesn't affect just border towns. People think that the stuff that goes on in Chicago is directly fueled by the drug trade from Mexico. Uh, and and they, people often think, well, you know, this is a gun problem. No, that's a crime problem. It's a problem that's much bigger than any of that. It has to be attacked from a number of levels, social, ed educational, uh, guns, and drugs. Uh, and even if you take the drugs out of it, there are other elements. If, if you think that drug dealers are going to immediately start to uh, work at McDonald's and stuff once drugs are, are legalized, you are sadly mistaken. You, you do talk about the economics right. quite a bit, and I, I'm, I'm sure that Mr. Dobbs added a, a bit about that as well. After reading this, I'm going to tell the audience that no one is ever going to want to go to Juarez. You I did don't think not that, paint a very good picture. Of no one, one wants to go to Juarez now, so okay. I wasn't worried about it. <laughs> I don't think they have, I, I would bet that they have 1% of the tourism they used to have from the U.S. Uh, that is a wild guess that a, I'm counting on none of you checking on the information to see whether I'm right or not. But they, uh, I remember when I went, there was a line to walk across and it was like five bucks, you walk across. You could spend the whole day there. People would go over and eat lunch, shop a little bit and come back. And uh, now uh, there, you can just look at some of the, the media coverage and you'll see the lines of people to come into the US and then you go over and it looks like lanes are closed. Those are the lanes going from the US into Mexico. The book is Border War, and the storyline is interesting. I'd like to, to do a little glimpse about this. The main character is an FBI agent, and he's assigned to this El Paso office that you call the Island of Misfit Cops. Now, what I want to know is, did you, did, that's a great that's, title. I, did I, you make that up, or no. are there places that cops really do not want to be reassigned to? Absolutely, and that I stole directly. I don't know if he wants me to name him, so I'm not going to name who it was. Okay. But he's a local cop who's a friend of mine. He's actually a commander. And uh, 
he got sent, he was doing a couple of assignments in his police department that he just didn't really care about doing. And they put all the administrative people, the people who handle the evidence and the radios and things like that were in one area. And when I went in to see him one day, he said, welcome to the island of misfit cops. As soon as he said it, I realized I'm going to steal that. It's great. Uh, but in this case, it's, and this is just my opinion. It's not, this is an intelligence unit he's on, which by nature, you don't make arrests. You don't, you're developing information that you pass on that maybe someone can turn into something. I like working on a case. I like chasing after people and, and doing what we have to do. I don't, personally, I don't like intelligence work. I've done it a couple of times. It's not, to me, it's not that big of a deal. So I used my perspective from this guy thinking, you know, he joined the FBI to change the world. And now through a couple of events, he's stuck with the world's worst supervisor in the world's worst location as far as he's concerned. He's from Baltimore, Maryland originally. And uh, now he's stuck out in the desert. And uh, he's been involved in a shooting that, uh, that is having a disastrous effect on his career. And that's how the book basically opens up. So I have to ask, we have this young FBI agent. We also have in, in the book a very famous broadcaster. I'm going to guess that Lou Dobbs had an input on the broadcaster part. Are, are you Erickson? Uh, no, absolutely not. First of all, I'll state this clearly, I would never work for the FBI. <laughs> uh, I was a DEA agent. There is a natural rivalry that will, I'm sorry, you can never get over it. I, I can remember, I went through the FBI Academy, which was the DEA Academy, was in there in the years I went through, and I never had any interest in it. Uh, but as far as uh, the broadcaster, he was my creation as well. And I, it looks like, because I wanted to have something that, now Dobbs added some of his dialogue and things like that. But the, the, the idea, I can remember years ago, you guys may not remember, that there was a border patrol uh, was involved in a shooting that two Border Patrol agents were actually ultimately indicted on. And Dobbs, when he was with CNN, broadcast from the border where the shooting took place for some time, I can't remember how long, a couple of weeks. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the same situation. He's come down to El Paso to show his support for law enforcement. And uh, that's how he gets tied up in the, the whole mess. But you created that character? Yes, oh, not Dobbs. Very interesting. I mean, Dobbs created a lot of characters in the book. Okay. That's, and that's what I, we talked about, is always doing something different, always doing uh, something you don't expect. I don't think he would, you know, when he looks at, uh, he wants the guy to do the right thing. Because, frankly, when you're, when you're talking to Dobbs, whether you disagree with him or agree with him, it, that's your choice. It would be hard to say he doesn't want the right thing to happen one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, he has no, uh, and he has no malice. He's a very friendly, uh, friendly guy. He actually, what he surprised me on, he's capable of playing a few pranks. Mm -hmm. And when you don't expect it, like the first one I didn't expect, he really gets you. And then, then it's all out war. He doesn't understand once you, once you do something to a guy like me who really is kind of immature and will remember that stuff. <laughs> then it's just pranks back and forth and nothing gets done. And eventually Fox goes off the air and no one gets arrested down here. But hey. So, so we had a lot of middle school stuff going on. I wish it was middle school. Okay. It's more like elementary school. <laughs> to me, the part in the book that made me crazed was the fact that you have all of these agencies, and I, I'm not sure I have all of them in my notes, FBI, CIA, NSA, you've got the, the Border Patrol people. Everybody is so territorial. Nobody wants to share. I, I was crazed by that. And they, uh, that's, I mean, that's, that's no secret. I wasn't letting out a trade secret on that one. Well, I'll tell you what's funny is in the time I was writing the book, the name of the investigative agency for what used to be the U.S. Customs Service changed. And I had to go okay. back and, and change it. What was it uh, changed to? It was originally ICE. Mm -hmm. okay. And now it's called uh, Customs. I can't remember. Something okay. in four. I got it right when I put it in the book. They could have changed again. And the only reason I knew is I was working with a guy who put on a raid jacket that had the new name. And I was like, hey, when did that happen? <laughs> The only thing really that they agree on in the book is that this is a terrible place to work. No and the, the border there. is a horrible place. The only one who wants to be there is the DEA agent who, who likes it, likes the excitement. Uh, and I knew DEA guys that they like El Paso. It's cheap to live. It's a nice place to live. And you can sort of, you can work in Mexico and live in El Paso, have a great family life. And the most action you ever want to see 
as a law enforcement agent. Whereas if you're working other places, you know, if you work in Miami and it's tough, you gotta live pretty far away for your kids to have a decent upbringing, in my opinion. People from Miami would be yelling at me right now, but uh, I worked in Miami while I still lived in Boynton Beach and my kids were going to school here, so I know what I'm talking about. We also have a love story going on, and I have to, and you always have a gorgeous woman in your books. They're all based on you. Uh, <laughs> isn't that sweet? Um, and she's really smart. I mean, those women in the book are smarter than the men. You never make, you never, it never pays to have the woman dumber than a man in a book. Yeah. And I never have a woman be a victim. Like in the early books, you remember, even when they were bad guys, I remember you liked it because they were bad guys. Exactly. And they, they would beat bad. the tar out of people. And someone said, you know, you would never hit a woman, would you? And I was like, I, I wouldn't be that insulting to not hit a woman if, if I'm making an arrest and she's doing something that I need to restrain her. I'm not going to say, excuse me, ma'am, uh, because probably the hardest you get hit is by women when you're not expecting it. So uh, women should be just as terrible as men when they're bad guys, just as great when they're good guys, uh, just as beautiful you know, when they're, as the men are handsome. I mean, I try not to make any distinction between it. Sometimes you're going to have stupid women, just like sometimes you're going to have stupid men. You know, your first book, Walking Money, was one of my favorites that, that you wrote. And I think it was because the characters, yes, but the dialogue was so clever. Okay, and and you said it's that. cop talk. Yeah, I just take everything I take, even in the, uh, I wrote a couple of science fictions, but are still based on, on police work. A lot of the dialogue from that comes from And a new police book coming soon, hopefully? Uh, in uh, March of next year, 2015, uh, Scent of Murder, which is a, uh, the first book I've ever had set entirely in Palm Beach County. Uh, it's based on a Palm Beach, it's not based, it's uh, the main characters are Palm Beach County Sheriff's deputies that are in a canine unit. So it has all the elements of canines, dogs, uh, and I'm very excited about it. Uh, it's, it's taken on a little life of its own. Did you ever work with a dog? No, but uh, you know, I, I, I've been involved in, all you need to do is see two or three situations where a canine takes control and you are a fan for the rest of your career. Uh, and, and it's not even, uh, I've seen it where all they say, you're chasing someone, and the canine gay, guy says, stop, or I'll release my dog. Mm -hmm. And everyone out on the street knows what that means, and I've never any, seen anyone, maybe once, keep running. Uh, they all stop, just having the dog around. Uh, and they're as close as super superheroes as we can have. They can smell something here, and track it five miles till you have to catch it. I mean, the things that they can do. So I try to get three dogs, three different abilities, a cadaver uh, dog, drug dog, bomb dog. How would all of those come together in, in, in one story? And uh, I, I, they seem to be very happy with it. It's again, it's through Forge McMillan. I can't wait. I'm a dog person, so I, 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 that's gonna be fascinating. And see, I didn't even realize that, I can't tell you how many people say that to me, I was just doing it because it was a good story. I thought good characters, and uh, but one of the associate publishers at, at Tor Forge uh, took an interest in it, and I thought, wow. It turns out she's a dog person. That's why, out of all the manuscripts they have coming through there, she read mine, and, and she had a couple of suggestions from a dog point of view, a dog person's point of view, and, and she said, "Are you interested in in making these changes?" And you don't say to the big boss at the company, "No, I'm going to ignore what you just told me." Uh, so I'm, uh, that's what I'm working on right now is making those changes. Luckily for you, you still work in law enforcement, so you don't have to think too hard about where the next story is coming from. And the name of the, the new book is? Scent of Murder. Scent of Murder coming out next spring. Can't wait to hear it. James O'Born, co-author with Lou Dobbs of Border Wars. It has been such a pleasure to have you as a guest on Between the Covers. I'm Ann Bocock, and thank you to Murder on the Beach Mystery Bookstore in Delray Beach and WXEL Television. Thank you all for joining me.